So welcome, we're gonna start while well, maybe some couple of people are still coming in. My name is Barbara Menna and I'm the Rothman Chair and Director of the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere in the College of the Liberal Arts and Sciences at the University of Florida. You are attending the last speaker of our annual speaker series entitled Transforming Institutions. This is the third year in which we are taking series, the second half of the name of our center, the public sphere asking what are the forces that shape the public sphere and how do the humanities help us think about them. Two years ago, speakers probed the topic of race and the promise of representation. And last year, we addressed data and democracy. This year, we have engaged with scholars who present a deep and research-based look at institutions that are in the crosshairs of public debates from reproductive health, health disparity, and mass incarceration to public monuments and the university and the humanities scholarship itself. You will note that we moved the event with Brent Legs to September 2022 in order to enable an in-person event. We will add a couple of links in the chat before we proceed, including links to our other series, Conversations in the Neighborhood, which aims at public engagement, and the Humanities Engagement Scholars, which offers programming for undergraduate students. We also include the link to sign up for our weekly newsletter. In a minute, Joy Connolly, president of the American Council of Learned Societies will give her talk. During her talk or at the conclusion, please post your questions in the Q&A or in the chat at the bottom of your screen and I will then read them after her talk and she will respond. Please do not hesitate to post any of the questions when they come to mind because they can just sit there till the end. It now gives me really great pleasure to introduce, introduce Joy Connolly. She began her service as the president of the American Council of Learned Societies on, in 2019. She's a scholar of ancient Roman rhetoric and political thought and their enduring influence on modernity. She came to the ACLS after serving as a provost and interim president of the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Prior to joining CUNY, she was the Dean for the Humanities and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and the Director of the College Core Curriculum at New York University. She's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Connolly earned an AB in Classics from Princeton University and a PhD in Classical Studies from the University of Pennsylvania in 1997. She's the author of two books, The State of Speech and The Life of Roman Republicanism and over 70 articles, book reviews, and essays. She speaks and writes regularly about the future of the humanities, the significance of studying the past, and the necessity of public funding for higher education as a keystone to robust democracy. Her talk today is entitled Co-Creating Knowledge, Collaboration, and Change. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much, Barbara. And I want to thank um, everyone at the center for uh, for your help in enabling this Zoom visit. I do wish I were there in person, uh, but um, but <laughs> it couldn't be arranged. So some other time, I hope. Um, I again, I'm really glad to be connecting with you and colleagues, uh, faculty, students, staff um, at the University of Florida. So thank you all, and I want to applaud to your your choice of series and topic. Um, it, it sounds to me incredibly timely and. Um, and I wish I could have attended every event. So um, uh, let me start off by saying uh, beyond thank you to, and, and thank you to the audience that a really a pretty significant amount of my time at ACLS at the American Council of Learned Societies is devoted toward your series subtitle, which is why I, I wanted to draw your attention to it, Transforming Institutions. In my case, as, as Barbara said, this is the institution of the research university and specifically what we now call the humanities. And this isn't to say that we aren't interested at ACLS in, in liberal arts colleges or community colleges or the social sciences or any other part of the university, but our focus is uh, scholarship in the humanities. So I hope my talk today will, will make it clear what kinds of transformations I think are most urgent and most exciting uh, and how I think we might best carry them out together. And this will involve you know, discussion of institutional change. So my talk today, like ancient Gaul in Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, to hearken back to uh, my, my uh, very earliest contact with, with Latin texts when I was uh, very small, uh, my talk is divided into three parts. 
And I'm also gonna talk, and I wanna call attention to this in plural registers. So I hope there will be something for everyone. I'm gonna offer some reflection on philosophical concepts. I'm gonna offer also some analysis of real life conditions in academia today. So I'll start in the first part with, uh, with Hannah Arendt, the mid 20th century thinker, most famous for her, her books, The Origin of Totalitarianism and The Eichmann Trial. Um, and, and I'll also in that section, take a brief look at the world in which Arendt grew up, the European university and the legacy of its institutional habits and how they're embedded in the challenges facing us in the humanities today. Next, I'm gonna talk about new directions in humanistic scholarship. And finally, I'll review some hard data about current conditions and I'll pose some questions. I think there are four questions at the end that I wanna recommend we should ask if we wanna change how, uh, how the humanities are institutionalized in the university today. And I, I'm thinking always with a view to increasing our scope and influence in the world. So I hope I'm gonna succeed uh, and keep to my time, first of all, and succeed in provoking a lively discussion uh, toward the question time. So I'm now gonna think myself into um, the state of Florida and, um, and pretend that I'm there with you. I am just setting my, my stopwatch so I don't go, uh, don't go over because I really want to hear from you. And this talk is really designed to, prov to provoke thinking together, to provoke talking together. So first of all, the, the purpose of the humanities. And as I said, I want to get there through the thinking of Hannah Arendt. I'm going to start with a very grandiose question, but one, one that's appropriate for right now. What do we ask of the humanities in the university today? What experiences and ways of knowing do, do we believe they make possible? In her essay, Introduction into Politics, and I'm gonna put this in the chat if I can, so everybody can see it. There we go. In her essay, Introduction into Politics, Hannah Arendt wasn't answering precisely this question about the humanities, but let's consider this thoughtful passage about understanding and communication. I'll read it out loud. If someone wants to see and experience the world as it really is, he can only do so by understanding it as something that is shared by many people, that lies between them, separates and links them, showing itself differently to each and comprehensible only to the extent that many people talk about it and exchange their opinions and perspectives with one another over and against one another. Arendt is talking about world making, the creation of a shared world of thought of creativity, of experiment, and common purpose, the place where the exchanges key to democratic politics can happen and where the individuality of human beings is made visible and their value as individuals thus preserved, a kind of paradox there, only in common can the individual self be preserved. She saw the purpose of the university as enabling that world making, thanks to its convening people around the activity of talking together about texts, ideas, and works of art and other things. Eduardo Duarte, a scholar of her work, comments in his account of her thinking about education, and I quote, she described her teaching as inspired by the hope that her students would be ready and able to respond when they were confronted with certain things, certain extreme things that are the actual consequence of non-thinking, end quote. And he has in mind here, um, and, and so did she, uh, totalitarian, uh, totalitarianism and, and genocide. And I have to say, even as I speak those words, the media and social media accounts uh, of, of university students taking up arms against Ukraine over the last week is a sobering reminder of the real world implications of this kind of thinking. It's, it's a moving thought. Well, for Arendt to stop thinking, to be thoughtless as Nazis like Adolf Eichmann became thoughtless, as she argued, is literally she claimed to lose the world, to lose the public space we humans hold in common, where we can speak and act as free political beings. To think, to be thoughtful, is to build and keep building in the act of thinking together and preserving the, predictable, the unpredictable plural world of human affairs. Arendt took from Kant the conviction that thinking allows us to handle human unpredictability and plurality because, and again, she's following him here, it leads to the enlargement of the mind, increasing the thinker's ability to understand the world from different perspectives and to form judgments on the basis of that understanding. Arendt's legacy of thought about world making, I find to be a useful way uh, into the challenges the humanities and in fact the whole university face precisely because of the palpable tensions it holds in suspension between plurality and unity, 
between novelty and tradition, and more too, between rigid disciplinary specialization, which she rejected throughout her career. She always insisted, and in, there's a great radio interview with her where she's uh, introduced as a philosopher, and she says, I'm not a philosopher. Maybe I'm a theorist, but I'm a thinker. And she really, re she, she had a um, much critical to say about the division of the university, which we'll go on to talk about. So she rejected this through her year, uh, throughout her career, um, and, and she championed creative intellectual exploration. Her, her attitude to thinking itself, that act to which you know, she devoted so much, so much thinking, so much writing, is another artifact of suspended tensions that bears directly on the experience of being and living in a university today. To recover and protect the world, she thought, we need a special kind of thinking, what she called worldly thinking. She rejected the purely abstract introspection and speculation that later in her career she saw embodied in the work of philosophers like her old teacher Heidegger, uh, the philosopher and, and Nazi enabler. She argued rather than indulge ourselves in abstraction, we need to understand the world we share in common with one another, a world that also allows us to distinguish ourselves one from another so that as individuals we can build a common mesh of plural perspectives and viewpoints. So she enjoined educators to, te to teach not, and I quote, not how to live a good life. So she didn't want people to teach morals or be moralistic or, or push belief systems, but rather she said educators should teach what the world is like and how to talk about it. This education she thought would make students world builders in love with the world, to use her phrase, committed to repairing and renewing it. Now Arendt misjudged many important issues. We're gonna to come to a couple of them in a moment, but I find that she links together the lived work of teaching and learning with empowered political, or we can call it civic engagement, or maybe we can just call it engagement with the world in a distinctive way that bears thinking about today as we try to carry on the work of the humanities under uh, not so friendly circumstances. Arendt students remember her seminars as spaces where they were invited to create spontaneous exchanges, where unexpected questions and digressions were welcomed, as were provocative connections between ancient texts and current events. Educated at Berlin, Marburg, and Heidelberg, Arendt's vision of world understanding and world making was shaped by the values and practices of the German university originally designed in the early 19th century, associated conceptually with Immanuel Kant, I've already mentioned, and practically with Wilhelm von Humboldt. As Chad Wellman has shown in his book, Organizing Enlightenment, Humboldt designed his university to tame the vast amounts of knowledge that was being produced and circulated on a global scope at a scale and pace totally unprecedented in human history. And this pace was made possible, of course, by the intertwined forces of technology, including uh, research uh, tools, including travel, relatively easy access to publishing, and the forces of European imperialism. In the Humboldtian University, students were imagined to, and, and the hope it was that they would gain knowledge through a particular disciplinary or aerial perspective for the purpose of living a well-informed life as a citizen, both of the state and of the whole world. So having established the scope of the university as the whole planet, Humboldt then divided that planet into disciplines and units of study that reflected, understandably, the intellectual and political priorities of European men. And that's a pattern that most American universities followed through the post-war period. Now this is, was the world that shaped Arendt and that for most of her life, she was committed to preserving by reading and thinking and talking about its texts. And she saw all these activities, I think it's important to note, falling victim to the flashy self-confident presentism of modernity, a period of human history that she worried had inaugurated the loss of the world, a phrase she uses often. And by loss, she meant at least two things. First, the replacement of the world of public discourse and action, the world where democratic politics is possible with commercial, materialistic, consumerist, self-involved, anti-public habits and practices. And second, she meant the loss of tradition, a specific tradition, the tradition of ancient Greek and Roman and European philosophy and literature and art that by the middle 20th century had indeed meant the world, in, in quotes, for generations, but of course, in radically different and unequal ways to different people. On the one hand, this world belonged to the ed educated Europeans and Americans who spoke the common language of, uh, I wanna put quotes around the world, Western history and culture. 
But of course, as we now know and think about all the time, it, it was a world imposed with varying degrees of efficacy on enslaved and colonized peoples, mostly in the global South. Their worlds were violently reshaped, uh, turned on end by European and then American power. For all Arendt's abiding interest in human plurality, her critique of habits of thinking that ran against public interests, her worry about consumerism and imperialism and what we would now call truthiness, and her deep impatience with disciplinary rigidity, her love of the intellectual tradition of ancient Greece and Rome and Enlightenment Europe severely constrained her view of that world that she said so confidently, and I quote, we hold in common. She did not ever probe the identity of that we, at least not deeply. As we know from her writing on race in America, she failed to grasp the damage done by racism and classism through, in this country throughout its history. And what I wanna to emphasize today though, as I think with you about the university and its peculiar forms of institutionalization in the humanities is this, like most thinkers of her generation, and I would posit many today, Arendt seems not to have considered that the common world she wanted to preserve through thinking might take very different and better shapes once we take plurality seriously and make it a guiding principle of the way we think about the world we wanna make and with whom. Well, I too, as you know, am a scholar of pre-modern texts and like Arendt, I worry a great deal about their disappearance and about their forgetting, about their erasure. So I'm having in mind, just to be clear with you, I'm not trying to hide my cards, a world in which all kinds of study um, are, are, are sustained and remembered. Now, let me suggest that as we start to consider how to strengthen the institutional form of the humanities as they exist today and structures so heavily influenced by the German design of two centuries ago, we'll do well to look back to earlier incarnations of institutions of learning outside our tradition. The university is after all often described as one of the very oldest institutions with an ongoing existence in the world. al Karawin in Fez, Morocco was founded as a madrasa in 859. Al-Hazar University was established also with a focus on religious education in Cairo in 970. Turning to Europe for a moment, but a different, a different uh, intellectual tradition, the University of Bologna began granting degrees in law in 1088. Now these are all sectarian and specific in, or, and or specific institutions. They fostered scholarship still though in response to public needs for knowledge about religion and the secular law. In this, they bear a distant kinship to Arendt's conception of the university as a place where we understand the world and preserve and build it afresh. As examples, they usefully enlarge our thinking beyond Europe in the case of the uh, universities or proto-universities in Morocco and uh, in, in Egypt. And they also push our thinking beyond traditional arts and sciences, and thus they help us see beyond the Eurocentric disciplinary structures we've inherited from Humboldt, which, which to many of our students represent baffling investments in an alien and unfriendly world. So we'll come back to that point. Arendt observed more than once that the basic, basic condition of human action and speech is plurality. Men, not man, inhabit the earth, she said, which I'm gonna translate into humans, not humanity, inhabit the earth. And we can add on um, if, if we're interested in talking about post-humanity, um, thinking about animals and the environment, um, uh, other ways of thinking about the world in which we live. But I'll stick for now to human plurality, which makes for one of the greatest challenges in thinking about the university as an institution, because the people literally who work and study in it are so many and so varied and so unpredictable. And to make matters more complicated, these people change in many and unpredictable ways. Because as college brochures tend to say, the university is intended as a site of transformation. This is worth dwelling on for a minute in light of the distinctive history of the American university, which is the place from which I'm, I hope it's very clear, you know, speaking from and, and to and about. The transformation of the individual and via thousands of individual students of society at large has been the purpose of the university in the United States since the seminary colleges of the 18th century. And they have a complex intertwined history with the European story. As many historians of higher education have shown though, even as administrators imported the German system of specialized departments and began to lay heavier emphasis on fostering faculty research, both the American college and the research university kept reiterating and still reiterate that their purpose is transformation and betterment of the individual. As the MIT computer scientist, Joseph Weizenbaum wrote, the function of a university cannot be to simply offer prospective students a catalog of skills from which to choose. 
without its function, the university would have to assume that the students who come to it have already become whatever it is they are to become. Surely the university should look upon each of its citizens, students and faculty alike, first of all, as human beings in search of what else to call it, truth and hence in search of themselves. By this aspirational but pretty typical account, the high function of the American university is transformation through the acquisition of knowledge. How this contributes to the activity of understanding the world and building a world in common is a question that I'm gonna to try to keep and I hope you hold in your minds as I continue. So recall that I put forward the madrasa and the law school as useful models of engagement with public needs and concerns for us in the humanities. I wanna think now about very concretely about the university uh, and the humanities in it today. I wanna to talk holding everything I've said before in mind about our habits of specialization today, about our priorities, about our familiar groups. From my perch at ACLS, I have a fascinating one because I can see um, through our fellowship competitions and my work with many colleges and schools um, a, a lot, I'm sure I know, not everything, but a lot of what's going on in human, humanistic scholarship around the country. And my sense is that the humanities in fact tackle both the transformation of the self through knowledge and building a world in common, working the intervals and sometimes the tensions of those projects in different ways. And the, the question though I ask every day is, as we recall these high purposes and the balance between those two, are we in the institutionalized humanities pursuing sufficiently plural means toward those ends? And you can tell from my tone, I'm skeptical that the answer is a, a, a full-blooded yes. I've talked so far about Arendt's conception of the world we, we make through study and shared talk, but now I wanna think a little more narrowly, focus in on the scholarship that humanists actually do. So my picture is also gonna be a little bit smaller scale. I see it as a house. The foundations are laid and the first walls are built by scholars of past generations. And here I'm thinking of the work most relevantly, I think to the American Research University of Kant and Humboldt. Later scholars add on to it. The house gets bigger over time. It stops being a place for people to live and becomes a thing of beauty to which we, we give our, our love and that we preserve for its own sake. We paint it, we decorate it, we build porches and parapets. We see just how high we can build our towers just because we can. And there's absolutely nothing wrong in all of this. But at the end of the day, the house humanistic scholarship has to be a place for people to live where they can transform themselves and build a common world. And this world has to be truly global. One of the most exciting developments in the humanities over the past 30 years or so is the way scholars have been treating the action of inviting more people into the humanistic house. When I was a graduate student back in the 90s, ages ago, in the age of the dinosaurs, it feels, the model was very much like this, open the doors of the house and let different people in. But now that paradigm has changed, and I think much for the better. I think we've begun to understand that when you open the doors wide enough, you need to redesign the whole house. So from a house whose doors or windows we push open, we're moving to something closer, I think, to a stoa or a hutong, or maybe even a cleared field marked only by movable boundary stones. Now, let me pause and, and tease out this point for a few minutes and, and bring us a little down to earth and, and talk about some examples. I've seen now, we have seen as a, as a whole academic culture now for some decades, at least four new directions in humanistic scholarship that I think amount to a quiet revolution. First, an uptick in scholar activism. For example, research on voter turnout that involves getting out the vote or research into public health or environmental problems that incorporates community-driven proposals. This work is often undertaken by teams of faculty working with teams of undergraduates. Second, community-engaged research where scholars work directly with many different people, speakers of indigenous languages, communities eager to collaborate in writing the history of their town, people trying to imagine a better world, and also scholars in other departments and disciplines. Third, comparative, transnational, transregional, and transtemporal scholarship, which frame questions at the margins or on the borders of states. Such projects compare the I in a lyric poem written in Uzbekistan with one in Sao Paulo, or concepts of criminal justice in ancient Assyria and China, or economic developments in agrarian cultures across the global south. 
Fourth, scholars are exploring new ways to circulate knowledge, including multimedia publications, graphic novels, team-written essays, work that incorporates creative writing or memoir or performance. You will have noted, I hope, that these four directions are difficult or, and even some of them impossible, literally impossible to pursue in isolation. They involve, they require acts of co-creation, of planned co-creation. And anybody who's done this work can tell you about the enormously generative effects, which are often difficult uh, to predict and difficult to contain within the seminar timetable or the semester calendar. All four of these directions and their emphasis on collaboration, relationality, and context have the potential and they often do respond constructively to the critique of the European thought world made by scholars like the eminent theorist and writer uh, and critic rather Sylvia Winter, who points out that our present arrangements of knowledge were put in place in the 19th century to serve the interests of imperialist Europe and we can do better. Scholars have been doing this work, as I said a minute ago, for decades. But for many reasons, much of it, and I'm thinking of work that's collaborative, written in the vernacular, that expresses itself in activity beyond peer-reviewed publications, tends to run into problems when it encounters the rules and habits uh, of uh, the university as it is currently institutionalized. And this, given the real challenges right ahead of us, is a serious problem that deserves our close collective attention. There are so many entry points into this discussion, um, but I, I, into this particular discussion, but I had to choose one I, I could certainly um, talk about and one that may have already come to your mind with my references to Humboldt's and Arendt's European pre preoccupations is the shape of our departments in the humanities and the relative attention that they give um, in, in the numbers of faculty and the shape of units uh, to Europe and America and, and the rest of the world. But and we can talk about that maybe in the question time. But for now, I'm going to keep to ACLS's main lane, which is humanistic scholarship. And I want to focus on the circulation of knowledge. Thanks to the explosion of digital technology, we live in a world where you know, more and more people have access to more and more um, information, if not knowledge. But while that is going on, scholarship, especially at the best resourced and the most influential universities, has become more and more highly specialized. And its audiences have tended to grow smaller and smaller each decade. Many scholars these days, particularly scholars of color and women, scholars who are first in their families to go to college and immigrant scholars would put the point I made a lot more bluntly. They would say, look, we feel pressured not only to produce ever more specialized knowledge, but to do so in isolation and in an artificial language that limits our audience and impact. Worse, it demands, and I'll say they, because I'm, I'm as a woman belong in this group, to a degree, but I'm speaking particularly really of scholars of color and, and immigrant scholars who have been the strongest voices in, in this conversation recently. So I'll say uh, it demands they assimilate themselves into structures designed to perpetuate worldviews in which they are marginalized, excluded, and devalued. As Sylvia Winter would say, the distinctive contributions of minoritized perspectives and discourses really, uh, they don't risk being lost. They are being erased every day. And I would also cite the insights of Gayatri Spivak and Candace Chu, Roderick Ferguson, and Grace Hong, to name just a few of the scholars I have in mind as I make this point. The limited forms of access acceptable scholarly expression, they say, build walls between the scholar and the public world the scholar hopes to reach, or as Hannah Arendt would put it, the world they're trying to build in common with others. So let me come down, you know, really right down to earth for a few minutes and consider um, a, real, uh, a real life case so that we can try to put together, as I'll say at the end again, um, some of the, uh, the, the kind of aspirational um, big thoughts and, and big picture values, uh, values talk when it comes to the humanities uh, with the lived life experience uh, in, in, in the academy today. And I want you to consider the case of an assistant professor in a humanities department who's coming up for tenure in a couple of years. She's revising her dissertation for publication, not an unfamiliar scenario. But think about the details. After two years of visiting assistant professorships with considerable teaching responsibilities in two different parts of the country, she's now in her fourth year on the tenure track. So this means she's working on a book, her first book, that derives from work she filed six years ago on the basis of research she began at least two years and maybe three or four years before that. In her spare moments, she must wonder, you know, she does, must this project have life as a book? What are the alternatives? Who might I talk to? How might I think differently? 
Our assistant professor starts to experience a rude awakening. She cares about her book deeply. How could she not? But she wonders, does it represent the best of what I have to offer the world? And even incremental change, change seems totally beyond the ken of the system. She wonders if her project might reach more readers as a podcast, with an essay, an essay with links to online data, or a comparative collaborative project with a colleague. Meanwhile, the online teaching, because my scenario is set right now, the online teaching she resisted when the pandemic started has opened her eyes to new possibilities for creating and circulating knowledge. So when she happens to learn that her local public library has created an online series to replace in-person public readings, she sees how her expertise might advance the library's effort to help readers understand, say, literary genres, which is her specialty. But as she considers and weighs uh, the advantages of pitching a lecture to the library, she feels guilty about spending time on anything but her book. It's the same with opportunities to have more impact as an educator during this time of crisis. Say a teacher at a high school in another country has asked if he can sit in her online class this fall. Might her university extend her course to him and his colleagues? What, way, what might she learn from him and other teachers who really know how to keep adolescents engaged? Could she play a role in bridging the two institutions, creating a new relationship that could continue beyond this immediate situation? Is there a research group in there that could reanimate her energies, engage her colleagues, connect with others around the globe as the mission statement of her school proudly proclaims everyone should do and serve the larger good? But ultimately she thinks, no, I'm not telling you anything you all don't already know. Um, I just think the problem really needs to be articulated so that we can solve it. But the reward system in place in the American Research, research University leaves, in most schools, leaves our assistant professor really no choice. Alive to, as she is to how she might learn and from and grow with people outside the academy, our assistant professor will probably call, follow her senior colleague's advice, publish her book, and wait till she has tenure to explore these opportunities. She's certainly being told there's plenty of time. But the thing is, I don't think we have much time. In addition to the hiring slowdown we're seeing now, we should really ask, I think, if the purpose of scholarship is to enrich understanding, presumably for people inside and outside campus walls, why is the central requirement for advancement at so many research universities so inflexible? The book, still the central pillar of a tenure file at research university, is, is a great way, but it's just one way to circulate knowledge. As philosophers and mathematicians know, shorter pieces can do the job very well. So can multimedia projects, podcasts, and community-engaged research, all the products of co-created knowledge I talked about earlier. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I, scholarship in its traditional form is a good. Books are good things. What I want to, to say, though, is that a plural approach to defining what counts in the production and circulation of knowledge uh, is one that takes seriously the goals of inclusive world making and world transformation and self transformation. And this means thinking differently, more plurally about requirements for tenure and promotion and the forms that scholarship is permitted to take and the shape of scholarly groupings in the university right now. I think right now we have an unmissable chance to listen and learn from the experience of listening and learning from our students and online communities in new ways. We should ask the really hard questions that follow from that about the ever higher value being placed on highly specialized research while our undergraduate and our public audiences evaporate. So let me give you a couple of examples um, thinking positively before, before I turn as I move towards a closing to some kind of brutal facts. But first, some, some good news and some good ideas, I hope. This September, uh, ACLS this last September, I should say, ACLS won a $3.5 million grant from the NEH to support publicly engaged scholarship. It's just, it's a new strand of scholarship for us. Uh, and we're excited about, about this new activity. Now the grant is currently underway, so I can't talk publicly about any of the projects, but you can get a sense of the kind of work we hope to support from a terrific 2008 paper by Timothy Eatman and Julie Ellison called Scholarship in Public published by the terrific collective Imagining America, then housed at Syracuse University. Sample projects in their survey include a public history of slavery, including the investigation and self-reflection on local history that was undertaken by Brown University under the leadership of President Ruth Simmons. A second, animating democracy through critical writing and publicly accessible writing about civically engaged art. 
A third, urban studies, engaging communities in questions of preservation, heritage, design, and development. And fourth, a museum-based community history focusing on immig immigrant labor. Nancy Cantor, then president of Syracuse, she's now the chancellor of Rutgers Newark, and then president Stephen Levine of the California Institute of the Arts, observed in their preface to, this, to the Eatman Ellison report, the deep and close connection between supporting a wide spectrum of what counts as scholarship and retaining a diverse faculty and graduate student population. Many faculty members, they wrote, experience a frustrating clash between their intellectual goals, which include pursuing community-based scholarship and art making, and institutional tenure policies. So part three, last part, coming to the end, and it's called The Humanities, Why We Need to Change Now. And I'm gonna be really very blunt in this final section, which is not long. One of the major article of obstacles to change in the humanities is ourselves. And here I very much put myself in this group uh, I, when I'm thinking specifically of our passions and our comfort zones. Consider the demographics of the arts and science professoriate in this country. Faculty in American research universities are overwhelmingly white and come from better off, well-educated families. A 2021 study of over 7,000 faculty across eight disciplines in the arts and sciences showed that today's PhDs grew up in households with incomes roughly 25% above the US medium, median, excuse me, and more to the point, it showed that faculty are 25 times more likely than the average American to have a parent with a PhD. My point here isn't simply that we should need to continue diversifying the professoriate in terms of race, ethnicity, and class, though I believe we must do so, but it's rather that our universities are filled with faculty who are thoroughly acculturated to its design, its reward structure, its habits of thought, and its styles of speech and writing. We, again, I'm including myself in this group, feel at home in this research university, in this world. We might be overworked and tired, but we love what we study, and we are, with some good reasons, resistant to change, since for decades now, so much change in the university has seemed driven by dollars rather than academic priorities. We're also committed to our doctoral students' success in landing academic posts, which is why most of them, not all for sure, come to graduate school. So we tend to recommend and replicate risk-averse approaches to scholarship, not only well-trodden topics, but particular forms of circulating knowledge, the ones I was talking about before, the conference paper, the peer-reviewed article, the university press monograph. But staying the course is not an option. Consider the steeply falling numbers of faculty lines and humanities majors. In the mid-1970s, between 2,500 and 3,000 jobs were advertised in the MLA job list. By the end of the 1980s, that number had increased to 4,000 posts per year. The financial crisis of the late 80s hit, that led to a sharp drop, but with the economic recovery, the numbers increased again and ended up beating out those 1970s highs until the crash of 2008-9. The total number, number of posts at that point fell abruptly from about 3,500 in 2008 to 2,000 posts just two years later. Numbers have fallen further since. Just under 1,600 jobs were posted in 2019. In 2020, just over 1,400. For the first time since the 1970s, when these numbers were first tracked, faculty lines have not grown as the economy recovered. The 2008 crash also brought down the majors count in the humanities. And once again, for the first time in history, while the economy has improved, especially for the wealthiest Americans, virtually all of whose kids go to college, the humanities numbers have not. Luke Menand recently summarized the picture very well in the New Yorker. And he wrote, between 2012 and 2019, the number of BAs awarded annually in English fell by 26%, in philosophy and religious studies by 25%, and in foreign languages and literature by 24%. In English, according to the Association of Departments of English, research universities like Brown and Columbia took the biggest hits. Now, we all know exceptions, and there are really important ones that we need to learn from in creative writing, in philosophy, in ethnic studies. And some of these are more than blips on the screen. But in the big picture, undergraduates in four-year schools, and especially in research universities, are walking away from the humanities. So how can we advance our evolution? Let me end with four questions that I really believe are worth asking by every humanist and also interpretive social scientist today. And I imagine some of, or many of you are asking these questions already. So another issue to talk about is how to make your efforts more visible. 
The first question is audience. What is the audience for your scholarship inside and outside the university? How big is it? And are you reaching the audiences you want? The second is colleagues. Consider your department, its history and traditions. Is it the right grouping for you? If you think it is, ask this question, are there others inside or outside this, the university with whom you wish to collaborate? And if not, why not? An interesting question to path to follow as well. Number three, resources for new approaches. Does your department or school offer resources for digital, public facing, collaborative or other non-traditional scholarship? Four, reward system. What products does the graduate student and faculty reward system in your school recognize and reward? And would you design the system differently? Now, I've come a very long way from Hannah Arendt's common world and its Humboldtian frame. But I did this on purpose because I think this is one of the, the greatest challenges of thinking and trying to bring about institutional change in the context of the university. Our structures carry a heavy load of history a heavy load of ideals that we need to understand. Our ecosystem is huge and fragmented and brutally competitive. And we also need to understand that ecosystem. So I'm trying to keep my eyes on the great purpose and the great promise of humanistic scholarship, which lends itself sometimes to grandiose or at least, um, at least very high-minded language. But I also know from my administrative experience that ideas and eloquent language are not enough. We need to think about, and that's why I talked about our assistant professor, the real world embodied experiences as well. But talks, as Hannah Arendt would say, and many others in her wake, should be a plural enterprise. So I'm going to stop there and hand it over to you. I look forward to your questions, your disagreement, your suggestions and comments. Thank you very much.